tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> The first story for this evening, our Season 1 finale episode, is by author Michael Whitehouse, entitled The Sealed Building. When I was a child, the school which I attended was peculiar, yet wonderfully interesting. Whether it was the fact that it was surrounded in places by overgrown bushes and opposite a strangely crooked wood which ignited my imagination, or perhaps the funny, eccentric, and sometimes fearsome teachers and kids which populated it, I do not know. I'm not sure of when it was built, but it certainly stood out from the houses and quiet streets which surrounded it, covered as it was in a fiery, bright red paint which drew your eyes to it immediately. There I went, from the age of five up until I was eleven or twelve, and like most children, I have both fond and cruel memories of it. Each day, with a rucksack on my back, I would wander past the crooked wood and wave to the lollipop lady, Mrs. Collins, a kind old woman whose job it was to stop traffic with her bright yellow sign, letting us cross in safety, and after meeting my friends, walk through the rusted brown gates into one of two playgrounds. It was rumored that in the past the two grounds existed to separate boys from girls, both an understandable and utterly outdated concept. By the time I had went to the school, the first playground had been assigned for those aged five to eight, the second for those aged eight and up. In the older kids' playground there lay a small red brick building which stood on its own, disconnected from the main school complex. It had long since fallen into disuse, and in fact had been sealed from prying eyes, its doors and windows walled up with stone and mortar, making it impossible to see what was inside. Its purpose seemed a bit of a mystery, as most of the teachers seemed to skirt around the topic entirely, but of course stories spread amongst the wild imaginations of children, and in my school this fondness for outlandish tales of tragedy and forbidden places, often led to bizarre rumors and whispers, particularly pertaining to the old sealed building. Obscurity is a fertile ground for the fantastical ruminations of youth. When me and my friends were in the younger playground, we would sometimes sneak down a narrow passageway which would lead to the other and peek around the corner. There we would see the older kids playing football or just hanging around. It is amusing how younger children look to their older peers, thinking that they seem to be having so much more fun than us. But before we could be chased away by the janitor 
or a passing teacher, my eyes would always lead to that sealed building. There was something lonely about it, isolated. And while it was surrounded by the yells and vibrancy of a schoolyard, its appearance suggested a grave silence to me. Some of the older kids liked to scare themselves and us, and told us dramatically that it had been used as a science department, and that there had been a hideous accident there, one which had produced strange and gruesome things which had to be kept from the world. Even as a child of eight, I knew made up nonsense when I heard it. Then there was the account that it had been a previous and rather brutal head teacher's office decades earlier, and that he died there in a fire. His ghost obviously still haunted the place, and it was better that the vengeful old sod be contained there, fuming at his desk as children enjoyed themselves and played nearby. Again, utter garbage. There was, however, one account of why the place had been abandoned which seemed more plausible to me. The building was in fact a toilet. Yes, a normal toilet. No frills, no secret laboratories, no dead spirits of an overbearing head teacher. It had simply been sealed up when new facilities were installed in the school to stop the children from climbing inside and getting up to mischief. But yet, despite this mundane explanation, there were still, in fact, tales to be told about the red brick, disconnected building and the older kids' playground. Although I had heard the stories, it wasn't until I was in my fourth year at the school that I became intimately, and at the time, uncomfortably involved with it. The older kids' playground was flanked on three sides by a rectangular section of the school itself, with the fourth side separated from neighboring houses by a moldy and dark red wall. It was isolated from the other playground, other than the aforementioned passageway, and, to further the feeling of imprisonment, was characterized by tall metal fencing, which rose up in places where a brave classmate might have attempted their great escape. Yet there was one old gate which did allow access of sorts, but like prison guards, the teachers tended to check on it regularly. There, in the corner of the grounds, lay the old building. Its windows were indeed enclosed in brick, as were its two doors, but the roof seemed unusual to me, being flat in places and surely gathering puddles of rainwater during the wetter seasons. I was, at that age, and embarrassingly still to this day, terrified by heights, and it was much to my horror when I discovered that climbing up onto the roof of the old toilets was seen as rites of passage of some sort. And don't in misunderstood me, we weren't forced to go up there, but children can be cruel, and when someone new to that playground showed weakness or fear, this would often result in them being picked on. Over the coming weeks, I watched as each of my friends climbed up onto the roof when the opportunity presented itself, dangling their legs over the sides nonchalantly once up there. One by one, claiming their right to be in the older playground, while I succumbed to ever-increasing taunts about my fear and cowardice. Don't disbelieve me when I say I did try. Several times, a ball would be kicked accidentally onto the roof, and my classmates would turn to me to retrieve it. I even made it up the side of an old drain pipe on a few occasions, far enough to reach my hand up and over to touch the roof's surface. Yet, each time I would fail. Fear would grip me, and with each admission of defeat, the name-calling and embarrassment intensified. I can trace back a curious and probably detrimental aspect of my personality to that time. You see, failure in front of strangers to this day does not bother me. But friends, family, even acquaintances? The very idea makes me break out in a cold sweat. Later in life, I followed the stereotypical path of chasing fame as a teenager, and I would have no problem playing in bands in front of those I did not know, but put a familiar face in the audience, and my nerves would take hold. The stakes of failure would be raised that much higher, 
in my mind at least. For this reason I chose an odd time to truly face my fear. One day after school I waited outside the gates, watching as the other children slowly siphoned out of the two playgrounds, kicking their feet through the autumn leaves. Parents escorted the youngest of my fellow students, while those of an older age walked with their classmates. Some eagerly, others not so, making their way down the hill past the woods to their homes in the surrounding area. As the school became emptier, and the teachers themselves began to leave, I walked down the street, entering the gardens at the back of the building. I always found the rear of my school to be an interesting place. It consisted of shrubs, bushes, and an old ash football pitch. Our teachers never seemed to use the area for anything, and we were actively encouraged to keep clear of it. Again, there were stories amongst the students that a child had been abducted while playing there years previously. Whether that was true or not, I do not know. Once I was as certain as I could be that everyone was gone, I sneaked through the bushes up a small incline to the rear of the playground. There, embedded in the wall, was the narrow brown gate which the teachers kept a watchful eye on, but as far as I knew was never used. I assumed that it had served a legitimate purpose years previously, but for me and my friends, it was the place where we would climb over to run around the school grounds at the weekend when no one was there. It was an exceptional place to play one man hunt, with so many nooks and crannies to hide in. As curious as I was, I wanted to truly attempt to get up on the roof of the old toilets. In my eight-year-old head, I had visions of sneaking up there in the morning and surprising my friends, or running up there to heroically retrieve a girl's ball. In childhood, we think that those around us really care about our actions, but in truth, they're of little consequence to anyone other than ourselves. Yes, I had been bullied a little for not being as strong or as fearless as those around me. And that sense of public failure, of insecurity, while a potent sensation at a young age, while in hindsight completely exaggerated, was enough to give me the courage to at least attempt the climb. I'd considered asking one of my friends to join me as I was nervous that a teacher might still be there, that I would get into trouble and so needed a lookout. But this would only have given me someone to fail in front of. I decided to attempt it on my own. After waiting for what seemed an age, I slowly climbed over the gate, which rattled unnervingly under my movements, echoing out around the playground. Then, after hesitantly observing the hundreds of windows which dotted the school for movement, and happy enough with the absence of light emanating from them, I stepped silently to the sealed building. Even though I knew as little as an audience of one could affect my confidence, I partly wished that I had not been alone, as the building and its deserted surroundings left me feeling uneasy. I knew, however, that if I just got up there once, that I would have conquered my fear and would be able to climb up on the roof with ease in future, hopefully putting any name-calling to rest. I stood staring at the drain pipe, which would be my avenue to success, climbing as it did through rusted fittings to the side of the building. My mind back then was often clouded with the worst possibilities, focusing on the most negative outcome and as I began to climb slowly, I imagined that the drain pipe would wrench away from the wall, throwing me against the concrete ground at any moment. The truth is that it did not move, no matter how much I believed that it did. Without a witness, I was now as far as I had ever reached, able to stick my hand up above me and touch the edge of the roof. My heart raced with excitement as I began to believe that I really could do it that success was in sight. I then made the mistake of looking down to check my progress. The experience of height is something difficult to convey to someone who has no problem with it. While in reality I was probably no more than seven or eight feet off the ground, I perceived this as a monumental distance. 
I felt my stomach churn, my heart beat erratically, and the world below began to spin and distort. Worse still, a loss of nerve permeated my body, leaving me feeling weak, and I could feel my grip begin to loosen. It's strange how the mind works, for just as I was ready to admit defeat once more and retreat, the insults and jeers of my classmates rang throughout my awareness as if they were present, down there taunting me. With what was, for me, a huge effect, I found myself continuing to climb upward, my hands reaching out to the damp roof, and then before I knew it, there I was, letting out a laugh of excitement, a sensation of relief washed over me. I could not wait for the next day. To be up there on the roof, proving those who had been cruel to me wrong, peeking over the edge, I still felt trepidation at the height, but nowhere near as much as I had done before, I triumph quelling my anxiety. Still, I was not too keen to remain there for long, so I decided to investigate my surroundings briefly, then climb back down to the safety of the playground and head home ecstatic. The roof was painted in a similar fiery red color to the main school building, but it had long since peeled and cracked, suggesting that it had been a long time since someone had been up there to give it a new coat. Standing up cautiously, I felt my legs waver slightly as my stomach churned again at the thought of how high up I was. Laughable, really, as the height of the roof was probably well, no more than ten feet. Yet, no matter how nervous I was, the sense of triumph which I felt coursing through my body was truly wonderful. I walked slowly from one side of the roof to the other, careful not to trip as I did so. The short walk from the drain pipe to the opposite ledge and back filled me with a feeling of conquest, as of someone patrolling their territory for those brief moments that roof, that building, was mine. Just as I turned to finally make my way back to ground, I noticed that in the middle of the roof there was a hole. I'm not sure how I hadn't noticed it before, although it was quite small, big enough for me to fit my hand through and a little else. Curious, I took a few steps, careful steps, and then knelt for a closer look. Yes, there, there was a hole, and the light from the evening sky passed straight through it, illuminating what lay inside. I put my eye as close as possible to the opening without blocking the light, and was surprised by what I saw. Down there in the darkness, like a peacefully preserved tomb, the old-fashioned white tiling remained intact. I could see the sinks where students years ago once washed their hands or flicked water at one another for amusement, and three stalls, cubicles with strong, dark brown doors, lying there as if still used. The air inside was tinged with dust and age. Yet, if someone had told me that the building had been sealed only the day before, I would have believed them. All but for one thing, a layer of stagnant water which covered the floor, no doubt accumulating there from rain dripping in through the opening in the roof. Then I became aware of a strong smell, one which left my eyes stinging slightly and my mood apprehensive. Yes, there was no doubting it. Someone was smoking a cigarette nearby. My heart sank as I lay there motionless, cursing myself for taking too much time on the roof to celebrate my victory. The teacher, or perhaps the janitor, must have stayed behind to work late and was probably standing in the playground below. I thought that they must have been close as the smoke smelled thick and oppressive. I lay curled up on the cold, wet concrete waiting for whoever was there to leave. The now almost caustic smoke seemed to be increasing in strength. And several times I had to hold my breath, frightened that I would cough and be caught. I do not believe I exaggerate when I say that I lay motionless for half an hour. Yet it took me all that time to make a simple yet unsettling observation. While I could smell the smoke, indeed feeling as if I was inhaling just as much as the unseen smoker themselves, 
couldn't see it. I would have expected to have seen the smoke rise up and over the roof, but not even the slightest wisp was evident. The autumn sky was now dimming, and I grew frustrated as the cold, damp stone below sent chills through my body. Wishing that I had never went up there in the first place, I felt hunger approaching and knew that by now my parents would be worried about me. I persuaded myself that I could at least dip my head over the edge of the roof and quickly take a look to see who was there. Maybe if they were on the other side of the yard, I could climb down unseen. I slid across the roof as quietly as I could and slowly peered downward, sure to not make any sudden movements to attract attention. There was no one there. The playground was empty, and the darkened windows of the main school building seemed as vacant as they had done before. Yet the smell and taste of cigarette smoke still filled my lungs and stung my eyes. Then I witnessed something which rooted me to the spot. A single, curling strand of smoke slid upward through the hole in the roof. Someone was down there. Someone was inside that room beneath me. This seemed impossible. As far as I was aware, there was no way inside. The building had been sealed off perfectly from the outside world. Yet there it was. A puff of cigarette smoke, which escaped first from the mouth of someone unseen below and then through the hole in the roof to where I had been lying. My triumph of finally facing my fear of heights seemed a distant memory, and now all I could think of was getting off of that roof to safety down below. But the hole lay between myself and the drain pipe, and curiosity being as gripping a mindset as any, I decided to take a quick look inside before quietly making my escape and leaving the building behind. As I approached the opening, the smell of smoke grew stronger still, and as I peered inward, the thought of don't look filtered through my mind. But it was too late. I had looked. At first there was nothing. The room below seemed darker than had done before, but this could be explained by the dimming sky and my eyes adapting to the change. What could not be explained was the noise I heard coming from inside. It seemed distant at first, indistinct and uncertain. Then it gradually took form. To me, sounding like someone choking, I smiled to myself thinking that it was probably the cigarette smoke and that maybe some local kids had a den down there. But then suddenly, in the gloom, my eyes were drawn to one of the cubicles. The door was closed and yet I was not convinced that it had been before. I tilted my head closer to the hole, but my angle of view shrouded the inside from inspection. As the choking sound increased in volume, so too did the smell of smoke. The sound and smell were joined by something which chilled my very soul. I panicked and let out a cry as the door quivered with impact as of someone violently kicking it from the other side. Smoke now filled my lungs, and as my eyes watered I could barely see anything, both inside the building and out. Then it stopped. The choking sound had disappeared, and the smell of smoke had simply vanished. For a moment I started to think that I had imagined it all. I gasped for air, drawing deep into my lungs, only for terror to take me once more. In the dark silence, in the cold, damp, and forgotten room below, the sound of footsteps and water filled the air. Then the cubicle door slowly began to creak open. I can't say entirely what took place after that. I believe I have blocked much of it from my memory. Apparently, the headmaster, an intimidating yet kind man by the name of Mr. McKay, had been in his office working late on the other side of the building. When he was disturbed by the sound of my screams, he rushed outside and found me on the roof curled up into a ball, paralyzed with fear, sobbing. After some reassuring words, he helped me down and took me to his office, where he once again guaranteed that I was safe 
and then phoned for my parents to come and pick me up. I trusted Mr. McKay implicitly, and as I fought the tears back, I described everything which had happened, the roof, the smoke, the cubicle. As I told him my story, the blood drained from my headmaster's face. I have long thought about what the old man told me in that office after hearing my account. Perhaps he wished to frighten me so that I, and others, would never venture up there again, and looking back it does seem to be a strange thing to share with an already frightened child otherwise. But he seemed genuinely disturbed by the events I had conveyed to him. He told me that years before I had went to the school, there had been a tragedy there involving a twelve-year-old girl, one who he refused to name. She had a reputation for being difficult. The teachers tried their best, sympathizing with her as she came from an abusive background, but they found her almost impossible to control, as she often threatened violence and had been suspended several times for fighting with other students. One day she decided to skip a class and had managed to persuade two other girls to join her by promising them a cigarette each. So, as the story went, the girls sneaked away when the bell for class rang and hid in the toilets. The details of what occurred afterward were less than forthcoming, but what was clear was that the poor girl had a seizure of some kind and died there and then. The other girls claimed that they had already left before this had happened, but there were rumors and accusations of which most only whispered but many believed. It was suggested that the girl had been with her friends when the seizure took place, and out of fear of getting caught smoking and skipping class, they lifted their friend into the stall, closed the door over, and then left her there. Whether they believed that she would perhaps recover or not was the subject of much speculation. The scratches and bashes on the inside of the cubicle suggested most definitely that she had continued to convulse while there, perhaps even in an uncoordinated attempt to escape and call out for help. In the aftermath, the building was closed off, and the school and community attempted as best they could to put the tragedy behind them. Perhaps Mr. McKay made the whole thing up just to terrify me, taking what I had thought I'd experienced and using it to concoct a story designed to scare me away from ever going back to that place. Unfortunately, a few unwelcome things transpired after that. I did indeed avoid the roof of that sealed building at all costs. My fear of heights was nothing compared to the dread which that building then held for me. My schoolmates, of course, did not believe my version of things, accusing me of lying about the entire story, just to avoid being made fun of. As far as they were concerned, I never got up there. Lastly, I did have a recurring dream throughout my childhood, one which I would wake up from in a cold sweat, curled up in my bed, screaming. I know that in it I would be lying on that roof, peering down through the hole into that abandoned place, but the memory always seems vague somehow. All that is left is an impression of a cubicle door creaking open and something staring up at me from within. This evening's second story is by author Jackson Mason, entitled Mr. Sweetly. I met my best friend, Jason, in our freshman year at a boys' high school in New York. Jason was the kind of guy that all the other guys looked up to. Tougher than tough, but also willing to give you the shirt off his back. He was one of the star athletes on the football team. All the girls went nuts over him, and to top it off, he always did really well in class. I don't think I ever saw him get anything lower than a B- minus in all four years of high school. Jason had it all. He seemed untouchable, fearless even, which is why I always found his dread of the school bathroom to be really odd. 
he would approach the door with childlike trepidation and only go in if myself or another friend were there with him or if he heard people inside. The times that I had gone in with him, I witnessed him perform a ritual of pushing all of the stall doors open and looking in, even if he was only going to use the urinal. When the stall door was shut, he would knock on it three times and wait for a response. Occasionally, if a stall was out of order or he received no response from behind a closed door, he would pull himself up to the door and look inside. The first few times I witnessed him do this, I said nothing. It was strange, yes, but I didn't think much of it. However, curiosity did eventually get the better of me during our second semester that first year, and I asked, Hey, Jason, why do you do that? Do what? He asked. I think it was an honest question. This ritual was so commonplace for him that it bled into the rest of his daily routine, as natural as breathing. All that stuff with the stalls, why do you do that? Jason gave me a grave look as he shook his head. Let it go, was all he said. I did let it go for a long time after that. It had slipped my mind almost completely, having seen it happen so often, that it was commonplace for me as well. However, one day when I went in to do my business, I saw three of the other boys in our year do exactly what Jason always did. Jamal, Sam, and Pete were pushing the stalls open, then shaking their heads at each other. At first, I was a little mad. I thought that perhaps they had seen Jason do this before and were making fun of him. I couldn't understand why, though. They'd always been pretty cool guys. But then I realized that they weren't laughing. They were being pretty serious as they completed their task. They also said hello to me as though nothing were out of the ordinary when they finally realized that I was there. What I had seen bothered me. I couldn't explain why, but it made me feel uneasy. That feeling was only exacerbated by the fact that I knew that Jason wouldn't tell me what was going on, and I didn't feel I knew these guys well enough to ask them. It was clearly a source of discomfort for Jason, and I assumed it might be for them too. One day, however, in our sophomore year, Jason and I stopped by the bathroom on our way to lunch. Jamal was in there washing his hands as we walked in. We said hi, and Jason went to begin checking the stalls. Jamal stopped him, though, and said, You're good, man. Nothing? Jason asked. No, you're good. Take it easy. Jamal replied and walked out. I waited a few seconds after the door closed completely behind Jamal to say anything. Okay, what is this about? Jason looked at me in confusion at first, but then his eyebrows narrowed. I thought I told you to let it go. You did, but I'm a little bit creeped out, dude. When it was just you, I thought that maybe it was some kind of quirk. But there are three other people I saw doing that. What is going on? Did you guys witness something in there? What are... I said let it go! Jason yelled. I was startled by that and jumped slightly. He was always pretty easy going, and I've never seen him get that mad within the two years that I'd known him by that point. I'm, I'm sorry, dude. I said rather meekly. Jason seemed flustered, almost like he was shocked that he yelled himself. Oh, don't worry about it, buddy. I'm sorry for yelling at you. Just... He sighed really deeply. Just please don't bring it up again, okay? I promised him that I wouldn't. For years, I kept that promise. Life went back to normal. Years went by and we grew up. Well, we got a little older anyway. And a few years after we graduated, I became an uncle. Everything was fine. I'd stopped thinking about Jason's bathroom ritual altogether. That is, until the beginning of this month. I was babysitting my nephew, who's now six years old, and I took him to the mall so we could spend the whole day just walking around. Before we left, I told him he'd have to use the bathroom. We went in, and other than the one guy who was leaving as we walked in, it was empty in there. 
I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and took a moment to fix my hair when I heard the sound of stall doors banging. I looked over to my nephew and saw that he was doing exactly what Jason had always done. He even looked under the door of a stall that had an out-of-order sign taped to it. Again, I couldn't tell you why, but it sent a chill up my spine. It felt like something was really wrong. I decided not to say anything at that moment, but I knew I had to ask him. When we were in the car heading back to his house, that's exactly what I did. Hey, Billy, I need to ask you something, okay? And you need to tell me the truth. He nodded his head, and I continued. Why do you open the bathroom stalls like that? We pulled up to a red light, and I looked at him in the rearview mirror. Billy slouched in his seat a bit. He looked up at me with fearful eyes. Just as I was sure that he wasn't going to tell me anything, he said, Mr. Sweetly. His voice was quiet and almost shaky, but I heard him just fine. What about Mr. Sweetly? Who is that, buddy? How do you know him? Does he work at your school? As soon as I asked that last question, I was struck with the realization that I was surprised it had never dawned on me before. Jason, Jamal, Sam, and Pete all came from the same grade school, the very grade school that my nephew Billy currently attends. That had to be it. Billy, did he hurt you? Who is he? Billy just pursed his lips and shook his head. I decided not to press the issue with him any further, not wanting to cause him any more distress than he was clearly already in. When I dropped him off, however, I pulled my sister over to the side to speak to her. I asked her if there was someone who worked at Billy's school named Sweetly. She, an active member of the PDA, who knows everyone at the school, told me that there wasn't. She also said that no parent or child had that name either. When I told her about Billy's behavior, she laughed it off and told me that the kids had been making up scary stories since Halloween is coming up, and one of them probably scared him. I didn't believe that was the case, but I didn't tell her that. Before I said anything else, I knew I had to meet with Jason. Last Saturday, Jason and I went to lunch. After a while, I finally said, Jason, I have something really important to ask you, and I need you to tell me the truth. Yeah, man, uh, what is it? I breathed in deep. I was kind of afraid of what his reaction would be. But I had to protect my nephew, even if that meant causing a scene or potentially losing my friend. I'm sorry, but Billy is the most important thing in the world to me. And so I asked, Who's Mr. Sweetly? Jason didn't yell. He didn't even move initially. The blood drained from his face and he slowly looked up at me. Where'd you hear that name? Just answer me, Jay. Who is he? Jason told me the whole story, finally, after all these years. And now I almost wish that I didn't know. According to the legend, in the 1950s, there was a man who worked at the school. His name was Melvin Myrtle, and he was the school janitor, often seen wearing a bowler hat and a suit, playing ragtime records from a record player he had in the janitor's closet. He was a goofy sort of man that everyone in the school loved. He was particularly good with children, and people often wondered why he and his wife had never had children of their own before she tragically died. They started calling him Mr. Sweetly, because he always smiled sweetly at everyone who passed by. One day, however, the school's other janitor, the father of a boy at the school, walked into the boy's room on the first floor to clean it. When he stepped inside, he saw Myrtle peeking over the wall of one of the stalls into the next one. The man became infuriated and forcibly yanked Myrtle from the stall. A long process of asking the children painful questions began, and it was determined that he did in fact have a habit of peering at children in the bathroom. Several girls stated that they had caught him peeping at them or their friends, 
but the kids he seemed to prefer were primarily boys. After the findings, Myrtle went missing and was never heard from again. Though the other janitor was suspected of foul play, eventually the charges were dropped. A couple of years later, a boy bolted from the bathroom, screaming his head off that there was a man missing half of his face in there watching him. Of course, the search yielded nothing. He gave a description of the man, and several other boys claimed to have seen him too. He would slowly poke his head up over a stall and either watch them at the urinal or in the stall next to his. He was wearing a bowler hat, and he was missing his lips and a large portion of flesh from one of his cheeks. The boy concluded his story with, I could almost swear he really was smiling. Jason told me that since no evidence could ever be found, teachers just began to think that it was a story that the boys kept passing down to each other starting with boys who were around when Myrtle's incident took place. So, with no help from any of the adults, the boys started to try finding ways to ward him off. After a while, they discovered that he doesn't appear if you look for him first, starting with his stall. The last stall to the right. That's where he was caught. That's his favorite place. That's where I first saw him, Jason concluded. He was shaking, rubbing his forearms in discomfort, eyes never leaving a spot on the table throughout the entire story. I felt so badly for him. He looked like a terrified child. I believed his story uh, a million percent because, well, why would he lie? How could he sell this story so well if he had never experienced it? Then he looked up at me and asked, Where did you hear that name? I told him about how I had seen my nephew do what he had always done in high school, and how Billy told me that name after I asked why he checked the stalls. Jesus Christ, Jimmy! What is wrong with you? I didn't know, dude. Jeez. I paused. You need to tell my sister this story. She has to transfer Billy to another school. I paused again. Wait, will that even help? You kept checking the stalls in high school. You still do that. Does he follow you? Jason shook his head. As far as I know, he doesn't. But that kind of thing sticks with you, man. I'm going to be doing that for the rest of my life. He huffed and scratched his head. I know your sister. Do you think she's going to listen to a ghost story and just pull her son out of that place based on that? She's a part of the fabric of that school. You need some kind of proof. Jason then told me about a rumor that there was something written on one of the walls in Sweetly's stall, as the kids started calling it, and that it was covered up by the administration. The rumor was that it appeared one day, sometime in the 80s, and was plastered over. A few days later, the plaster was entirely gone, and the writing was perfectly legible again. After that, they moved the toilet paper dispenser over to that side and bolted it over the writing. When I asked Jason what it said, he told me that he wasn't sure. No one's ever been brave enough to try to find out. We agreed that day that we would each call out sick and take Billy to school on Monday. Jason would pretend that he was just visiting for the nostalgia, since some of his old teachers were still there, and we would stop in the bathroom before we left. We did just that, but we both froze in front of the bathroom door. You okay, dude? I asked. Jason only nodded. Hey, uh, before we go in, I continued. What happens if I see him? Jason shook his head and said, You won't. If you've never seen him before as a kid, he won't appear to you as an adult. It's part of the reason why none of the teachers ever believed us. We took deep breaths and walked in. Jason checked all the stalls and I stepped into his sweetlies. I managed to pry the lid off the toilet paper dispenser and I unscrewed it, with a degree of difficulty, from the wall and the mini-slot screwdriver I had in my pocket. Jason couldn't even go near the stall after checking to make sure that it was empty, so it was all up to me. I pulled the dispenser from the wall and looked. 
There was indeed writing. Someone, or something, had etched a poem into the wall. As I read it, I could swear that I heard the faint sound of ragtime music coming from the air vent. The air also seemed to get a little colder. Jason sensed that something was wrong as well. He started frantically telling me to hurry. I tried to take a picture of the poem with my phone. The screen flashed, the phone glitched, and then it just stopped working. It hasn't worked since, and I've had to replace it. I wound up jotting it down on my arm very quickly, and I haphazardly replaced the dispenser because I wanted to get out of there. This is the poem that was on the wall. He smiles sweetly, what a doll. He watches you from his stall. Don't be rude. Don't call him creepy. Call him by the name of Mr. Sweetly. He loved the children of this school. Yes, to think otherwise, you'd be a fool. And though he did act most discreetly, they found him out, poor Mr. Sweetly. They called him a peeping Tom, though he insisted he did no wrong. But a parent sliced his face so neatly, giving him a toothy grin. Oh, Mr. Sweetly. So he lurks now forever in his stall and endeavors to rattle you to your core completely. He's watching you now, that Mr. Sweetly. Jason and I are planning to speak to my sister this weekend. We hope that, armed with the poem, my dead phone, and Jason's experience, we can convince her to put Billy in another school. One more thing. I've been hearing the ragtime music in every public bathroom since reading that poem. If I'm alone in there, the air feels cold, and I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Despite what Jason said, I think Mr. Sweetly followed me. I may not be able to see him, but I can feel him just fine, and I can swear that he really is smiling. The day after Jason and I took Billy to school, I returned to work and tried to go about the day as normal. Rather as normal as you can be with the knowledge that your nephew is being terrorized by a dead man and that there is very little of anything you can do to stop it. I was succeeding in this endeavor, too. That is, until I went to use the bathroom. The room was empty when I entered, and although it felt eerie considering what had happened the previous day, I went about my business as usual. After a minute, the room felt colder. The just barely audible ragtime music that accompanied the temperature change was also unsettling, and I could not shake the feeling of someone staring at me. Instinctively, I spun around to look behind me. Of course, nobody was there, but I didn't feel like I was alone in there anymore. There was the kind of feeling that I was referring to in Mr. Sweetly. It was exactly like that in every public bathroom that I've used since reading that damn poem. No matter where I was, be it work, a restaurant, anywhere, the air in the bathroom would become cold and ragtime music would seem to play from the vent. That's not the extent of it, though. I now know that the cold and the volume of the music increases the longer I'm in there because I decided, a few days after the initial incident, to stay in the bathroom at work for a while after everyone else had left for the day. I needed to know if it was just paranoia or if I was legitimately experiencing this. So I stayed in there, just standing, and I waited. Eventually, I felt the air grow colder, and bumps started to form on my skin. The music, too, began, though it was at first a faint whisper. However, by the time I finally ran out of the room, I was shivering and the music was so loud that I felt the beginning of a migraine. I could actually see my breath, and the music started to almost sound as though it was playing in my own head. At first, I would experience these kinds of things exclusively in public bathrooms, so I did not think that I would no longer be safe elsewhere. However... I have since begun to experience other odd occurrences in my own home. I've been waking up with a peculiar sensation, like water is stuck in my ears. It sometimes feels as though something is fluttering around inside my ear canal, and everything I hear is soft and muffled. 
When I first wake, it feels as though there was a great amount of pressure applied to either side of my head as I slept. For a week and a half now, I've been experiencing this. It eventually goes away as the day progresses, but I feel like I've gone deaf or like... I had been submerged in water for prolonged periods of time. The first morning that I awoke to this feeling, I threw up after I got out of bed. The pressure I felt in my head had begun to pulsate painfully, and I felt disoriented as a result. My vision was shaky and my eyelids were heavy due to the pain. The throbbing sensation, coupled with the way that the room seemed to move as soon as I stood up, made my stomach turn. I barely made it to the toilet and nearly fell as I rushed to the bathroom, which would have led to my head cracking against the sink or the toilet. Though I still feel sick in the morning because of this new sensation, the pain has dulled somewhat. I'm unsure if that is just because I've gotten used to it, though. At first, I had no reason to believe that this had anything to do with what I had been experiencing in public bathrooms. But then I also noticed that the TV in my living room would be on in the morning when I woke up. I can't fall asleep if there's even a hint of light or sound, so I make sure to turn off anything in my apartment that produces either of those things before I go to bed every night. This is especially true lately, since I have been having great difficulty falling asleep at all. Not wanting to jump to unnecessary conclusions, though, I thought that the TV may be broken, so I had my neighbor down the hall, he's an electrician, look at it, but he couldn't find anything wrong or damaged. The occurrence that convinced me that I was followed, though, came the morning that Jason and I were to speak to my sister, Liz. The bathroom in my apartment is fairly small, there's just enough room for me to move about, but it can be uncomfortable. Were I a larger man, it may be impossible. The toilet faces the shower, and if I were to sit and stretch out my legs, my feet would easily touch the bathtub. If you were facing the shower, the sink is directly to the right of the toilet next to the door. If someone were in there with you, behind the shower curtain, perhaps, it would become obvious pretty quickly that you were not alone. As I was getting ready to go talk to my sister about the situation, it felt like someone was standing in my shower watching me. Of course, when I pulled the curtain open, nobody was there, but it was unnerving. The worst of it, however, was when I was shaving. I nicked myself pretty badly because I could have sworn I saw someone in the mirror watching me from over the shower bar. I grabbed a hand towel and applied pressure to the cut on my neck as I ripped the curtain open a second time. Again, there was nobody standing there. Since this incident, my shower curtain remains open at all times. I put a towel down to absorb the water that splashes onto my floor as a result. The smell of mildew is a small price to pay. My stomach was tied in knots that morning. I'd been feeling progressively more sick the longer I had to wait to speak to Liz but Billy. Jason and I had originally planned to speak to her the day after Halloween, but we had to postpone. I felt like I was going to vomit when I received her text that she, her husband, Norm, and Billy were going to stay over with his cousins in New Jersey that weekend. Can we please do this some other day? I promise it'll be soon, the text concluded. I cursed at myself for not outright telling her that the important thing that I needed to discuss with her was Billy's safety. I hadn't wanted her to start panicking and demanding I tell her right then, either through text or over the phone. This felt like something that needed to be addressed in person. I was thinking about that on the drive over, and I wasn't sure how Liz would react. My stomach lurched when Jason and I pulled up to her house. She was outside, getting ready to take her flower pots inside now that the weather is getting colder. She looked up at us and waved with a big smile. She has no idea. It was the only thought that kept repeating in my head from the first moment I saw her. It feels awful to be the person to give bad news, especially to someone you love. And it's even worse still if it's about someone you both love. She put down the watering can and ran up her walkway to give me a bear hug. Hey, kid, she said as she wrapped her arms around me. 
Liz, who is the older one, had greeted me like that my whole life. I found myself wishing that she wasn't so happy to see me. I forced a smile and we followed her inside. Where's the little guy? Jason asked when Billy didn't immediately rush into the room to greet us as always. Boys day out, just Billy and his daddy. Liz said as she cleared off the table and put on a pot of coffee. After she set cookies and some paper plates on the table, she took a moment to breathe. So, she said, what's so important that you guys wanted to tell me in person? We sat down and began to tell her that we were worried about Billy as she poured the coffee. At first, she seemed every bit as concerned as we were. When we began to tell her about who Mr. Sweetly was, however, she began to take us less seriously. The real low point was when she laughed at us. You've got to be joking, Jimmy, she said. The look of disbelief she wore was intermingled with faux amusement. Halloween was last week. Stop trying to scare me. That's sick. Liz, this isn't a joke. Why would I make up something so terrible? Why would I joke about Billy being in danger? She thought for a moment, but shrugged. I don't know, but it's not funny. Jason let out an exasperated sigh. You're right. There's nothing funny about this. I went through exactly what Billy's going through right now, and I'm scared for life, Liz. Please, please don't do that to Billy. So what? Norm and I just pull him out of school a couple of months in and put him somewhere else where we don't know anybody? Because you're telling me that there's a ghost haunting the school that nobody else can see? The kids can see him, Liz. And yes, that's exactly what you guys do. You'll adjust. And you'll get over it, I said, getting more irritated and hostile by the second. What does that mean, she asked, folding her arms. You're more worried about your stupid PTA friends than you are about a creep possibly hurting your kid, I said. I knew that this would cause a huge fight, but I was angry and said the most cruel thing I could think of in that moment. I felt sorry for saying it almost immediately. Liz had wanted to be a mother since I could remember. She would die for her son without a thought, and I do understand how things must have sounded at her end, but I didn't know what else to say to get through to her. I thought that if I said something hurtful enough, she would dwell on it and really have to think about our discussion. The argument that ensued was explosive. What did you just say? Liz yelled, standing and leaning toward me over the table. I said that you don't give a damn about your kid. Why would I make up something like this? You're so goddamn thick, Liz, I yelled back, standing, myself, and pointing at her. The anger had completely washed over me at that point, and I felt much less guilty for saying it this time. It continued like this for about ten minutes before she kicked Jason and I out and banned me from seeing Billy. I'm not even allowed to see him for his birthday in a couple of months. I've been sick over this, and if I think about it long enough, i become furious and upset all over again. You're probably the reason he's been having all those nightmares, she yelled out to us just before slamming the door. Those nightmares, I thought. How long has he been having nightmares? My heart sunk to my stomach. I had to stop myself from thinking about it before I went insane. Since I hadn't been sleeping well, Jason had driven us to Liz's house. When we got to his car, I kicked the tire in anger and tore the door open, dropped into the seat and slammed the door shut. Jason got in more gracefully than I had, and we sat there in silence for a few moments. Now what? he asked. I considered punching him. I'd lost any tolerance I had for him a couple of weeks prior to that, even since before we spoke to Liz. Truth be told, the more I think about it, the angrier with Jason I become. I can understand his not wanting to tell me about any of this in high school. But the day that Billy was born, he should have told me. He should have said something. If he had, maybe none of this would be happening. 
Anyway, at that moment I decided that punching him would get me nowhere. We keep looking for evidence, I replied flatly. We make it impossible for my sister to keep him there. There have to be other people who went through this. I'll track them all down if I have to. Jason and I both knew the improbability of me being able to find every single person who'd ever seen Sweetly, but he remained mercifully silent at my comment, allowing me to brood. He turned the ignition and began to drive. After a few more minutes of silence, we began to discuss how we'd go about contacting people. Facebook was the most logical choice, so I sent messages right then to the only other people I knew of who had been through this, explaining the situation. Pete, Jamal, and Sam. A few minutes later, I noticed that Pete saw my message. I haven't heard back, and I'm pretty sure that he blocked me. We pulled up to my apartment building, and Jason told me to get some sleep. He told me I looked like a zombie. Again, I felt the itch to punch him, but he didn't. Instead, I got out of the car and slammed the door behind me without saying a word. I'm not sure what it was that I was looking for, and I wasn't even sure that I would find anything, but I had to try. I hoped to hear back from Sam or Jamal, preferably both, but I didn't really bank on either of them lending me a hand, especially not after Pete's apparent refusal. I regret ever dragging anyone else into this with me. On December 8th, I went to work as usual, and I was exhausted. I hadn't been sleeping well since the strange events I have previously described. Several co-workers made comments about how disheveled I looked. At first, I tried to muster a smile, but I lost my ability to do that by about the fourth time I'd heard, Whoa, man, what happened to you? The day seemed to go on forever, and I hardly had done any work at all. I felt myself starting to doze off slowly when suddenly the most intense feeling of anxiety that I have ever felt in my life hit me like a ton of bricks. My eyes snapped wide open. I felt like I couldn't breathe and my chest seemed to grow tighter with every attempt to inhale. I felt sharp pains in my chest and my head began to throb. I began to hear the strangest pulsating noise in my head that became so loud I couldn't hear my co-workers speaking when they rushed over to me. I only assumed that they were asking me if I was okay. I hadn't even noticed that I'd fallen off my chair. The last thing that I remember before blacking out is seeing my co-workers huddled around me, worried looks on each of their faces as the vignette that seemed to surround them grew darker and darker until the whole scene was engulfed in blackness. The one odd thing that I seem to recall, and I'm not sure if it was just my mind, playing tricks on me, is seeing a man standing behind the group of people crowding around me. I didn't get a look at his face, but I was certain that I had never seen him before. He was wearing a suit, which I thought was odd, since most of us dress more business casual. The man appeared only to glance at the scene with mild interest before walking away. Everything looked as though it were going in slow motion, When I came to, my co-worker, Tim, was sitting next to me in my desk chair. I'd just been placed on a stretcher by medics, that were called, just after I had lost consciousness. "'He's awake! He's awake!' Tim said to one of the two medics. Then he turned to me and said, "'Oh, my God, Jim, are are you all right?' Everything still felt foggy, and I was only just starting to hear everything like normal again. I nodded and mumbled, "'Yeah, yeah, yeah, I think so.' One of the medics, a tall man with a blue uniform, stepped to my side where I could see him. Hi, he said, his voice very calming. He waited for me to respond. Hello, I said weakly, trying like hell to force a smile, which drained even more of my energy. He smiled back and said, My name's Kevin. You can call me Kev, okay? I just need to ask you a few questions to see how you're doing. He asked me to state my full name, my date of birth, what year it was, what month it was, and who was the current president. I mumbled through most of it, but my voice became stronger with every answer. They took me to the hospital where I stayed for three days while they ran various tests to make sure I had nothing life-threatening. During my stay, I had only two visitors, my boss and Jason. 
The former came by to make sure that I was okay, but he also told me that I was to go on a mandatory, indefinite medical leave of absence. Don't even think of coming back until you're cleared by a doctor. I mean it, James, he said. I tried to argue, but it was pointless. James, you've been a zombie at work lately and you're barely getting anything done. To be honest, I've been a bit worried about you. This is not like you at all. He assured me that I could take all the time I needed, that my job would be waiting for me when I was healthy enough to return. It's just work, he said. This is your health, which is more important. When Jason showed up, he was the person I gave as my emergency contact, Considering Liz and I were still not speaking, he was pale and looked as though he were visiting someone on their deathbed. Christ, Jimmy, he said after looking me over. You look terrible. What the hell happened? I told him the truth. I wasn't sure. But I had an egging feeling that all of this was being caused by his ghoul. I guess the good news is that I'll have all the time in the world to look into this and work it out, I said. Still going to need your help, though. You're not off the hook, Jay. Yeah, anything, man. Whatever you need. Good. First, I'm going to need you to try to contact the guys again. I'm going to try to use this time to rest up until I get released. I have a feeling I'm going to need it. When I was released that Friday, Jason picked me up and took me to my office so that I could retrieve my car. He informed me that he tried to reach out to the guys again, but with similar results. Jamal, however, answered his message almost on cue just as I was loading my belongings into the back seat of the car. Hey, Jimmy, that was Jamal. He said he's willing to hear us out. Just give him a time and a place. Tomorrow night. Any time that works for him, my apartment, I said. Jason sent him the details, and I left once I got confirmation that the meeting was on. I trudged up the stairs to my apartment. I'm not much for elevators. I got stuck in one when I was 12, and the memory has not quite left me. And I only live on the fourth floor anyway. It's usually not that bad, but when you've spent three days in bed, it takes a bit more effort to complete. I paused at the landing and caught my breath before walking to my door, which was three doors away from the staircase. Just as I found my keys in my messenger bag, I heard the elevator ding and the doors open. I turned my head and saw my next-door neighbor, Tabitha, exiting the elevator. Her bright green eyes lit up when she saw me, and she gave me a big smile as she walked over to the door to the left of mine and leaned on it. Hi, she said with excitement. I was taken aback by how genuinely happy she was to see me. She beamed as she spoke. How are you feeling? From the first day that I met her, I had been in love with Tabitha. She was kind and she was selfless. She was a freelance artist and looked every bit the part, mostly wearing bohemian styles. In addition to her beautiful green eyes, she had light red hair that came down to just under her shoulders. Her smile could light up a room, and I could never help myself from smiling back, even if I hadn't felt like smiling all day. Her voice was soft and sweet. She had a tattoo of a fairy on her outer right ankle, and a small hoop nose ring in her left nostril. Tabitha was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Uh, hi, I said, flabbergasted, not just by her sincere happiness to see me again, but by the fact that she seemed to know where I had been for the past three days. I'm feeling much better, thanks, but um, how did you know that I wasn't feeling well? Your friend, uh, was his name Jake? I saw him going to your apartment the other day and asked him about you. When I saw him, I realized I hadn't heard you come home the day before. Oh, okay. I said, chuckling to myself, I'd almost forgotten that I had asked him to get me some things for my place the first day I was hospitalized. Yeah, Jason, or anyway, we call him Jay. Oh, right, Jay, not Jake, silly me, she chuckled, too. Well, I'm glad you're okay, Jim. Um, your friend also told me that you were going to be home for a little while to recover, 
So if you need anything, you know where to find me. Really, even if it's just to watch a movie or something. I remember what it was like when I went from working in an office to working from home. I almost went stir-crazy. So if you get lonely or need me to get you something, just come knock on my door. Whenever, okay? I couldn't help the big, dumb smile that spread over my face. Okay, I said. I will. Promise, she said, pointing at me. Promise, I said. She gave me a smile and went inside her apartment. I scratched my head and sighed as I turned the key and entered my own. Whatever good feeling I had a second ago with Tabitha nearly melted away entirely when I closed the door behind me. I remembered the feeling of pressure on the sides of my head and the sensation of water in my ears that I'd wake up with. I felt uneasy standing there. Then I noticed the blinking red light on my answering machine and went to investigate it. The little screen showed that I had twenty missed messages. I thought that that was odd, figuring that if people were going to try to get in touch with me, they would call my cell phone. That was when I remembered that my phone had died and I hadn't bothered to charge it while I was in the hospital. I'd been in no mood to talk to anyone. So I picked up the receiver and began to check my messages. All of them were from Liz and she sounded frantic. So much so I could hardly understand her, only picking up a word here and there. I hung up, then called her back. She sounded like a mess when she answered after just one ring. Jimmy, she sobbed. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. She said more, but her sobs were swallowing every word. Okay, Liz, it's okay, calm down. I said in the most reassuring voice that I could. I was still angry at her, but she was obviously and sincerely remorseful. I thought that she probably heard somehow that I'd been in the hospital, that she was racked with guilt for what she had said to me once my health became questionable. I soon realized, however, that she was apologizing for a different reason. Just slow down. Oh, okay. What were you saying? It, it, it's Billy, she choked out. Hey, hey. She began to sob harder. What happened? I was now starting to panic. Is he all right? Yes. <laughs> she managed to say through sniffling. Her voice was now very quiet, almost a whisper as she attempted to keep control over her voice. But he was hurt. He broke his arm on a bathroom sink at school. She paused for a moment, and I shuddered at what she had just told me. We thought one of the older boys did it, but he kept screaming at me. He kept saying that it was Mr. Sweetly. He was screaming at me, Jim. He was so scared. He told me he wanted to go to another school. He begged me not to make him go back there. The crying continued, but it was a bit more subdued now. So what are you guys going to do? Norm and I discussed it. Norm still doesn't believe any of this, but he thinks that if our son doesn't feel safe at school, well, we have no choice but to put him somewhere else. Billy's home for now, though. He's really shook up. He doesn't even want to leave the house right now. I sighed deeply and massaged the bridge of my nose with my thumb and forefinger, shutting my eyes tightly. Okay, I'll come by and see him tomorrow, but Liz, when did all this happen? Tuesday. I got called that there had been an accident a couple of hours after I dropped him off, she said. Tuesday, December 8th. It seemed to be around the same time that I had my incident. I was now certain that I was not imagining a correlation between all the things that were happening to me and my introduction to Mr. Sweetly. Liz apologized another few times before I hung up the phone with her. Afterward, my night was not that eventful. Not wanting to cook, I just ordered a pizza and watched a movie to try to wind down before bed. I considered taking Tabitha up on her offer, but ultimately decided not to. I didn't want to be too obvious, and I would have been extremely nervous around her. It seemed counterproductive, so I went to bed and tried to get some rest. Around 3 a.m., I woke up with the same uncomfortable feeling of being underwater that I had been experiencing in my room for a while. Then, when my hearing normalized, 
I began to hear what I thought were voices coming from my living room. I grabbed the baseball bat that I keep next to my bed and went out to investigate. Instead of being met with intruders, however, I saw that my TV had turned itself on. The picture was nothing but static, but I heard what sounded like muffled voices and faint music. I attempted to turn up the volume to hear it better, but strangely it didn't get any louder. After a minute, however, the audio cut to static, and it was loud enough to wake up the whole floor. I quickly shut the TV off, leaving myself in darkness. I stood there for a moment and decided that I would sleep on the couch the following night. I couldn't fall asleep again, so I just stayed up and read for a while, until sunlight began to show through my blinds. I sent a text to my sister around eight that I would be there in an hour. After I got ready, I went to the toy store and got a gift for Billy, then made my way over. Liz was waiting for me on the porch when I arrived. She gave me a big hug and apologized again, inviting me inside. So, where were you when I called? You didn't answer or return my call for three days, she asked, making coffee. I was in the hospital. I had an accident on Tuesday, too. Liz froze for a moment and gave me a concerned look. Do you think? Yes. I think what happened to me and what happened to Billy are related. I just don't know why. Maybe when I jotted that poem on my arm, I invited it into my life, too. I don't know, but I think he's pissed at me. He? The, um, she looked around to make sure that Billy wasn't there before she whispered, The ghost. I nodded and drank the coffee that she put in front of me. Why would he be pissed at you? I shrugged. Uh, Maybe because I'm trying to stop him. I waited until Billy was awake so that I could spend a little time with him before I left. I gave him the stuffed elephant I got for him and signed his cast. I promised him I'd see him soon, and then I left. I slept for a few hours and got ready for the guys to come over. I hadn't seen Jamal since we graduated, so when he walked through the door, I was surprised to see how much he'd changed. In high school, he was skinny, sported a Patrick Ewing-style haircut, and was just under Jason's height for the first two years. Now, he was taller than the both of us, had a buzz cut, and was very muscular, though still lean. "'Hey, Baker, what happened to you?' he asked, giving me the once-over. Then a grin spread across his face, and he added, "'Looks like you've seen a ghost.' He shook his hand and laughed. "'Jerk.' I said, smiling myself. One of the things that I had always liked about Jamel was his somewhat twisted sense of humor. I was actually going to ask you the same question. Went a bit heavy on some supplements, did you? I made my quotes with my fingers. Jamal pulled his hand away and raised them both in mock offense, backing away from me like I had wounded him. I'm all natural. I've been into MMA for a while now. It's my outlet. For all this crap, he said, waving a finger around in the air for emphasis. I nodded. Fair enough. And on that note, thanks. I know that this must be really hard for you to be doing, and I really appreciate it. I tried getting in touch with Sam and Pete, too, but neither of them got back to me. Jamal looked at me funny. His eyes briefly darted to Jason before coming back to me. You guys don't know. When I responded with a confused expression, Jamal said, Sam's been missing for like three years or something. Nobody knows what happened. He just upped and vanished like smoke. Pete was really messed up over it for a while. Even went into a psych ward for a bit, I think. I see his brother sometimes, though. What I hear he's doing better. But he's still a mess. My stomach turned. Why hadn't I heard about this? Sure, I wasn't friends on Facebook with either of them. Not that I ever really logged on much, anyway. Only attempting to add them when all of this started. But Jason would have known. I looked at him, my face contorted, like I was suffering from a headache. Did... You know about this? Jason shifted uncomfortably, his mouth agape and his eyes, scanning the room for something to look at that wasn't me. Jay, 
I said forcefully. He walked over to my recliner and collapsed onto it like a sack of potatoes. Finally, he looked at me and said, Okay, please don't be mad, Jim. What do you know? What else aren't you telling me? I wanted him to know that I was still extremely pissed off at him for keeping Mr. Sweetly a secret in the first place. Okay, okay, so... About four years ago or so, I got a message from Sam. He told me that he and Pete were going to look into this. I sent Pete a message and asked him what was going on. He told me that Sam had become increasingly obsessed with Mr. Sweetly, and his life was spiraling. He was into cocaine for a while, he got arrested a couple of times, and his fiancée left him. Sometimes Sam would send me messages that made no sense, like this one, he said. Jason stood up for a moment and took his phone out of his back pocket. After a few scrolls and presses, he handed me the phone. It was open to his Facebook messages with Sam from the time that this happened. I skimmed him, being more disturbed as I went. What started as full correspondence slowly devolved into cryptic sentences or simple one-word responses. The last one he had sent to Jason only said, "'Closer.' So close. I handed Jason his phone back, feeling even more perturbed than before. Next thing I know, I get a call from Pete telling me that nobody knows where Sam is. That's all I know, man. Jason said. The extreme urge to hit Jason was coming over me again. My fists were shaking from anger. You stupid bastard. When were you going to tell me about this, hmm? Didn't you think that this was something I should know? We're doing the same thing that Sam did. Don't you think that was pertinent information? God, you were in the car with me when I tried to reach out to them in the first place. I hadn't meant to yell quite as loud as I did, but I didn't care. Look, man, I know, I know, I, I screwed up, I'm sorry. I didn't want to scare you. Jamal, who had been leaning against the wall during the whole exchange, took a few steps towards us, arms folded. If I had told you, would you have stopped? he asked. I furrowed my eyebrows at him. He rubbed his chin and said, Look, the way I see it, you probably wouldn't have stopped anyway, right? Not until your nephew was safe, at least. I understand that you're pissed, and you have every right to be, man, but... The way I see it, you found out exactly when you needed to know, right? I glared at Jason for a moment, then I shrugged and said, Yeah, whatever. I guess you're right. Yeah. So the only thing left to ask yourself is, if you really want to do this, now that you know that bit of info, do you still want to do this, Jimbo? Jamal asked. He waited a moment before adding, I'm with you either way. I'd be more happy to forget all of this, but if you say we're doing this, I'm in. I know what your nephew went through, bro. I know why you're mad. And you're going to need help. Sam tried to do it on his own when Pete decided he didn't want to do it anymore. You need a team. I looked at the both of them. We're doing this. I want to stop this from happening to anyone else. I spent the next hour filling them in on everything that had been happening to me. All of the things that were too much to discuss through texts or over the phone. Then we discussed how we would go from there. We decided that we would meet whenever possible to discuss what we may have found and build up a plan of attack. Our first order of business, we agreed, would be to go to the school to look through old yearbooks and make a list of any people that stood out to us. Jamal's cousin worked at the school, so we would ask him to help us out and if he could, help us get some contact information for the people we listed, or any other relevant details. We also knew that we may have to talk to Pete at some point, but we were not going to do that unless it was 100% necessary. One more thing, guys, I said as they left. I want to know what Sweetie looks like. They looked at me in confusion. I told you what he looks like, Jim. I want to see it, Jay, I said. 
I suggested that we find an artist to do a portrait of him. Jason hesitated, but Jamal agreed to describe him to an artist so that I could get a good idea of who I was up against. Jason volunteered to find an artist that he felt would do it justice. With that, they left, and I was alone. I grabbed my pillow and pulled my blankets from my bed, spreading them over my couch. I covered every source of light, however tiny, in my living room and kitchen, and then settled in for the night. I managed to fall asleep pretty quickly as I was exhausted from everything that had been going on, but I did not sleep through the night. At around 3 a.m., I woke up with a jolt as my TV turned on by itself. It was obnoxiously loud, and I was so startled by it that I cleared some air as I jumped and fell off my couch. It was nothing but static, which made no sense, because my cable setup was functioning fine. I even muted the TV and changed the channel to see normal programming. When I changed it back to the channel that the static was on... The show was playing as though nothing had happened. I knew I hadn't left the volume that loud, so I unmuted it on a whim to find that the volume had returned to normal. I ran my fingers through my hair in frustration before shutting the TV off and attempting to go back to sleep with very little success. I did manage to doze off again around 9 a.m. and stayed asleep for a couple of hours, but was woken up by a knock on my door. With my blanket still wrapped around me, I looked through the peephole to see Tabitha standing there with grocery bags in her hand. Damn it, I thought to myself. I knew I looked like hell and probably didn't smell much better. I glanced at the clock on my stove, which said it was 11.50 a.m. Just a minute, I called through the door. After tossing my blankets back on the couch, I ran into my bathroom Gargled some mouthwash, sprayed some cologne on myself, and ran my fingers through my hair a bit. It still didn't look presentable, but it was better than it had been. I rushed back to the door, removed the latch, and opened it. Good morning, Tabitha said, beaming. Uh, good morning, I said. Do, do you need anything, something? I cursed myself in my head. I also swore to myself that if I could find a way to punch this dead bastard in the face... I would. Tabitha laughed. No, I'm fine. But I bought you some groceries. Nothing fancy. Just some bread, milk, eggs, cereal, cold cuts. I also got you some snacks. And toilet paper. Just some stuff to hold you over for a couple of days until you're ready to go out on your own. I smiled at her and invited her in. The truth was, I hardly ever went food shopping, so my fridge was practically empty. I was very grateful. So how are you? She asked as she helped me put everything away. I heard you yelling last night in your TV early this morning. I know the TV had been bad, but I didn't realize in my sleepy haze that it might wake up my neighbors. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. She shrugged. I'm a light sleeper. The faintest noise wakes me up. But really, how, how are you? Uh, I'm hanging in there. She smiled at me again and said, Good. After she put the last of the snacks in my pantry, she clapped her hands together and looked at me. Well, that's everything. I'll just be heading back to my apartment now. But don't hesitate to knock if you need anything. Really. I laughed. I know, I know. You made me promise, remember? With one more smile, she was out the door and I realized how hungry I was. As I made myself a ham and Swiss sandwich with the groceries provided by Tabitha, my phone rang. It was Jamal. I wiped my hands down with a paper towel and answered, Jamal, please tell me something good. Yes, I spoke uh, to my cousin. Is the next Wednesday good for you? Jay isn't sure if he can make it, but I figured if he can't, we'll just fill him in. That's perfect. See you then. Cool. I'll come by and pick you up around uh, 2.30. See you then. I didn't get much sleep that night either because the TV did the same thing. This time, I didn't bother to change the channel or mute it. I just shut it off. I couldn't fall asleep again for a while and I sat there in the dark until I saw the first light of morning creeping into my blinds. 
I wondered with dread if this was going to happen every night. Unfortunately, it did seem to be the case, and as was usual, I was exhausted when Jamal showed up to get me that following Wednesday. I'd waited outside my building, and he was right on time. We told him about how my TV would turn on by itself every night around three, and how it would wake me up. It's woken up my neighbors a couple of times, too, I said, yawning and rubbing my eyes. It's just static and loud noise. Have you tried unplugging the TV? He asked. Yeah, and no, but I will. I said sheepishly. My head had been so far up my ass that I wasn't using common sense hardly at all anymore. We headed over to the school and I began to feel nauseated as we approached. The last time I had been to that place was when this all started. I began to wonder if I had it in me to set foot through those doors again. Jamal seemed to sense this as he parked his car in the lot next to the school. He removed his key from the keyhole and gave me a look. Are you ready for this? You look like you're going to be sick. I rubbed my eyes and shook my head rapidly as though to get rid of all my insecurities. With a deep breath, I nodded and got out of the car. I began to walk toward the school, and though my knees shook a bit at first, I was eventually able to steady myself. I opened one of the massive glass doors and led the way inside. Jamal then took the lid and guided me to his cousin's office. The door to the office was opened, and I saw a man sitting at the desk looking at a computer. Jamal knocked, and the man looked up at us with a grin. "'Hey, cuz, what's up?' he said. It took me a moment, but I recalled having seen him before. He, too, had gone to the same high school as Jamal and I, though he was two years younger than we were. I'd seen him around the school, but I didn't know he was Jamal's cousin. "'Hey, Omar,' Jamal said as we walked over to his desk and fist-bumped with his cousin. "'Do you remember Baker?' he asked Omar, motioning toward me. "'Jim Baker, yeah, yeah, I remember you. Played soccer, right? Saw a couple of your matches. You were pretty good. You still play?' I laughed. (laughs) "'Thanks. But no, that was a long time ago. I haven't played in years.' "'Hmm, that's a shame,' Omar said, reclining in his seat a bit. So, Jamal filled me in on your situation. I don't know how much I'll be able to help, but I'll give it a shot if it means getting rid of this thing once and for all. He got up and led us to the library. As we walked, Omar told me that he, too, had gone to this elementary school and had the misfortune of seeing Mr. Sweetly on several occasions, including once when a couple of older kids decided to play a trick on him. They told him the coast was clear and then held the door closed, so he couldn't run out when Sweetly appeared. When his teacher finally went to look for him, they found him on the floor, rocking back and forth, covered in his own filth and eyes swollen from crying. However, because none of the adults ever believed that there was a ghost haunting the school, the older boys weren't punished past being scolded, though his older brother, Stephen, beat the crap out of them a week later after school. That's why I decided to work here, of all places. As an alum, it was easy to get the job, and I figured there should be at least one adult in this place that knew these kids had been telling the truth, he said. Omar showed us where the yearbooks were kept. We couldn't take any out of the school, but we were able to make photocopies. He told us to take our time, and while we were looking through those, he would look through record archives to see if we could find anything useful. With that, he left us to our task. Since it was after hours, we had the place to ourselves, which was nice. Jamal and I searched the spines of each of the yearbooks on display until we found the ones from the 1950s. We pulled all ten, five each, off the shelf and brought them to a table nearby to look through. We thumbed through page after page, looking at the smiling faces of students and staff, all of which were now either in early retirement age or long since deceased couldn't stop myself from wondering just how many of these kids were scarred for life because of this monster that my friends and I were now hunting. It turned my stomach and made me furious. That fury gave way then to an icy chill up my spine when I turned the page to see a picture of two men standing side by side, each holding mops and smiling. 
The one on the right was wearing a dirty jumpsuit and looked like a janitor, but the other was in a suit and wearing a bowler hat. A glance at the caption underneath the picture confirmed that I was looking at Sweetly himself. It read, Melvin Myrtle, left, and Donald McCallum, right. Thank you for keeping our school so clean. I visibly shuddered. Jamal took notice and asked, Did you find him? I nodded. Do you want to see? He shrugged and said, I'm going to have to eventually if we keep this up, so might as well. I turned the book around and showed him. He had a very similar reaction to mine, but then he just shook his head. He looks like a pretty normal guy, doesn't he? He asked. What makes someone do what he did? That question hung heavy in the air as we both got back to looking through the books. Other than a couple of pictures of Sweetly and the name of the other janitor that was initially suspected of foul play, we didn't glean anything particularly helpful from the yearbooks. Jamal did, however, find something disturbing in the 1957 yearbook. He had turned the page and loudly exclaimed, Whoa! I jumped in my seat and asked what he found. He turned the book to face me and I saw what had been a picture of Melvin Myrtle with a big X drawn over each eye and the pupils poked out with what I assume was a pen. Over his lips, someone had drawn teeth in an odd, almost triangular design over one of his cheeks. The caption that had been under the picture was crossed out and beneath it, someone had crudely etched a simple yet chilling phrase. Sweet no more. We looked at each other and shared the same sort of oh-crap look, agreeing that this was definitely something we needed to photocopy. We wrapped up our search through the yearbooks, noting that Melvin Myrtle didn't appear in any past the one from 1957, and began to photocopy what we needed when Omar came back into the library. If anyone asks, you guys broke into the archives and stole this information, okay? He said, handing me a few pages of copied records. I looked through to see that he had given me the address that Marvin Myrtle had on file when he worked at the school, as well as those of Donald McCallum, a couple of teachers, and five students from around that time. The last few probably won't do much good, but maybe you guys can figure out something to do with these. Those teachers were involved in questioning the students, and the five students I picked out were the prominent ones that were involved. But for real, if anyone asks, you guys went into the archives and copied these on your own, he said. Oh, man, thanks, he said. It was the first time I'd been positive about something in days. Jamal and I put all the information we gathered, held in folders provided by Omar, in the back seat of his car. After we settled in and buckled up, I called Jason. He picked up after four rings... We filled him in on what we found, and we scheduled a day when we could next all get together. We were all in agreement that we should hold off at least well, for one more week. We would split the workload and sift through everything we had gathered to see what would be useful and what we should put on the back burner. Jamal dropped me off in front of my building, and I took my share of the information we gathered. He told me he'd swing by Jason's and give him his share, and we parted ways. When I got back up to my apartment, the first thing I did was pull the plug for my TV out of the wall. I didn't need to watch TV and I had a lot of work to do. For four nights, I slept soundly. There was no underwater feeling, my TV didn't turn on, and everything was quiet. I spent the days sifting through the printouts and making notes. I tried to Google the names of some of the people from the yearbook, and I also searched for the addresses I had taken from the list. One of the houses was that of Melvin Myrtle. I made sure to include his and my share. I typed the address into Google Maps, and we looked at it on Street View. It looked abandoned. There was paint chipping off the boards, the lawn was not manicured, and it seemed sort of dead inside the windows. I printed a picture of the house just to have on standby, I left all of these pages scattered on my coffee table when I went to sleep that night. I woke around 3.15 to use the bathroom. 
After I was done with my business, I shut the light off and started back to my couch with a great big yawn. However, before I could move even a couple of feet, my TV turned on with the loud static. I had not plugged it back in since pulling the plug days earlier. I wanted to rush over and shut it off, but my blood ran cold, and I froze in place. At first it was just static, but the static gradually grew quiet as another sound became louder. Soon I heard a ragtime jingle, almost like a radio advertisement from the 40s or 50s, though the picture remained static. I was already scared, but what I heard next sent me into full-blown terror. Voices began to sing, in that same radio advertisement style, and the words made me quiver. He smiles sweetly, what a doll. He watches you from his stall. No, don't be rude, don't call him creepy. Oh no, God, no. Call him by the name of Mr. Sweetly. I finally found the ability to move again and rushed to shut the TV off Just as they began the next part of the poem, I sat down and pulled my blankets around me as I started crying. I knew that I had been followed, but this confirmed all of my fears. I stayed awake until the sun came up. Then I went back into my room and collapsed on my bed. I don't know how long I tossed and turned for, but I eventually fell back to sleep from pure exhaustion. I slept until about 1.30 the following afternoon, when I was woken up by a faint knocking on my door that would not have awakened me at all had I not been on such high alert. I figured that it was probably Tabitha checking in on me after hearing my TV again, so I sprayed cologne on myself and answered the door. Hi, she said after I opened the door. Just want to see how you were doing. I haven't spoken to you in a little while, and I heard your TV again late last night, so... I'm still hanging in there, I said, and tried to force a smile. Good, she said. Hey, I'm going to try to make lasagna tonight. Can I bring you some? I'll even eat with you if you want the company. I'd invite you over, but my apartment's a mess. There's canvases everywhere. I can barely move around in there myself. I agreed. Not so much because it was Tabitha, although that helped but because I was dreading being alone. That night was the first in what became the norm. Tabitha would hang out with me almost every night until about 11, except for the nights where I met with Jamal and Jason. We would watch movies and recommend books to each other. If I thought I was in love with her before, this only made those feelings stronger, and I became more and more afraid of her finding out what was going on. Fortunately, she never asked, at least not for the first couple of months. One night in mid-March, after we had just finished watching an old monster movie, she turned to me and said, Jimmy, I don't mean to be noisy, and you can totally not answer my question, but what's going on with you? What do you mean? I overheard your friends when they left a couple of weeks ago talking about how they were worried about you. And sometimes I hear you talking to yourself after you shut your TV off early in the morning. Regardless of whether it was plugged in or not, my TV had been turning on to sing the jingle every night without fail since the first time I heard it. I was usually able to shut it off before the singing started, but I had started growing somewhat accustomed to it, to the point where I would not always wake up immediately. I sighed. I'm going to ask you something, and I want you to know that I'm very serious. I paused in fear of her thinking I was crazy before asking, Do you believe in ghosts? She nodded. One of my childhood friends grew up in a house that was haunted. I experienced a lot of strange things whenever I went there. Doors slamming gusts of wind through closed windows, and I swear I saw something once. A lady in white that I could see right through. Why, is that what's happening to you? I sighed and scratched the back of my head. Uh, Sort of, but not not really. Well, okay. This is going to sound crazy, but... I told her the whole story. 
I went and got all of the printouts and notes, and I spread them over my coffee table for her to see. I expected her to run for the door or to throw the salt at me. Anything but what she actually did. She looked at me with profound concern in her eyes, and just when I thought she would suggest institutionalization or medication, she asked, Is there anything I can do to help? I was shocked that she took it in such stride. Did you listen to what I said? About how dangerous this thing is? About how he attacked my nephew and can hurt people? How one of the guys I knew in high school went missing because he was doing exactly what I'm doing now? And none of this sounds insane to you. She smiled sympathetically and said, Yes, Jimmy, I heard everything you said, and no, it doesn't sound insane. I know that it could be dangerous, but I want to help you. Tabby, no. I've gotten enough people I care about involved. I don't want to get you hurt, too. She smiled and blushed. You care about me? Yeah. You're one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I wished we'd started hanging out sooner. I was just always too shy to talk to you. And I hate that it took these circumstances for us to get to know each other better, but I'm glad we did. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. It's getting late, but I think we should continue this conversation tomorrow night, after your friends leave. I smiled at her, knowing that I was blushing, too. Sure. I mean, if you haven't changed your mind about me being crazy by then. She laughed and said, I doubt I would. I'll see you then. She got up and grabbed her things before heading to my door. As she opened it, I called to her. Tabby, wait, I said. She stopped and looked back at me. Just be safe, okay? I said. She smiled, nodded, and shut the door behind her as she left. That night, despite everything, I managed to sleep well. I even managed to fall back asleep very shortly after I shut the TV off. Well, when it turned on at 3 a.m. Screw you, sweetly. I thought to myself with a smile as I rolled over on my couch and shut my eyes again. The following night, the guys came over as planned. Up until this point, we had only met sporadically, unlike how we had initially intended. However, we had a breakdown of the important information we needed, and we were ready to move on to the next phase of our plan of attack. We were to go on a bit of a field trip and visit the addresses we decided were of the most importance, including Sweetley's. We were going to start by asking people living in the other houses in the neighborhood if they'd been Sweetley's neighbors or if they remember anything. Part of the reason why we hadn't made an attempt to do this until then was, well, that I wasn't feeling physically or mentally up for it. At that time, though, I was ready. My strength and my courage had boosted, and I was finally ready to take Sweetley head on. Jason also finally brought the artist's portrait of Sweetley over. I shuddered when I looked at it. How accurate is this? I asked them. So accurate, I almost peed myself when I saw it, Jamal said. Jason nodded gravely at the sentiment. I put it with the rest of my research, and after tying up one or two more details about our trip, which we had planned to make the following week, I rushed them out so that I could get everything ready for Tabby. They laughed at me as they left, and I felt like we were in high school all over again. I couldn't help but smile. Tabitha came by twenty minutes or so later. It started like any other night that she would come over. I'd pour us each a glass of wine. We'd pick a movie to watch and talk for a bit. During the movie, though, she leaned over and pulled me into a kiss. Then she smiled at me, her eyes bright, and said, I've wanted to do that for a really long time, Jim. We continued to make out for a bit, but decided not to go any further that night as Tabby didn't feel ready to do anything else. We finished the movie, her cuddled up beside me, and we wound up falling asleep together on the couch. I woke up at 5 a.m. from hearing some kind of noise. At first, I went to shut my TV off, but I slowly realized that the sound wasn't coming from my TV. It was only then that I started to gather my bearings and notice things. For starters, Tabby wasn't there. 
I assumed that she had woken up before me and decided to head back to her apartment. Next, as I said, it was 5 a.m. Why hadn't the TV turned on like usual? And what was that strange noise I was hearing? It took me a moment, but I realized that it was coming from the hallway. Tabby! I thought and jumped up, running to my door with intense fear. I almost forgot to undo the latch in my haste to swing my door open. Once I did, I was met with the sight of all of my neighbors standing outside of their apartments, some speaking with each other, some being questioned by police officers. One of the cops saw me emerge and walked over to me. Hello, sir, uh, she said, a notepad and a pen in her hand. Is it all right if I ask you a few questions? I nodded and stuttered. Yeah, but officer, what happened? One of your neighbors had an accident, the woman who lives next door to you, she said, pointing behind her to Tabitha's door with her pen. My stomach sank. What happened to her? Is she okay? Probably noting the frantic tone in my voice and the concern on my face, she answered, She's a bit bumped up, but she'll be fine. Are you her boyfriend? Sort of. What happened to her? I asked again. She fell down the stairs over there. She told us that she was pushed. She said she got a look at her assailant, so we're asking around to see if anybody has seen the man she described. He was an older white male in a suit and bowler hat, possible scars on the left side of his face. Does that ring any bells? Have you seen anyone like that around here? No, I haven't, I said. It wasn't exactly a lie, as I hadn't seen Sweetly around my apartment complex. She asked me a couple more questions about when I last saw Tabby, when she left my apartment, and if I knew of anyone who might have had reason to hurt her. After I answered all of her questions, she moved to someone else, and I stood there for a moment, staring at the stairway. I was filled with intense dread. I had never wanted to get Tabby involved, and now she was. The very last thing I remember before blocking out is walking back into my apartment. As soon as the door closed behind me, my TV turned on. The volume wasn't loud and there was no static, just ragtime music and the singing voices. The lyrics, however, were different this time. He smiles sweetly, what a doll. You can't stop him, not at all. Continuing will cost you steeply. You belong to Mr. Sweetly. With that, the TV turned off and I blacked out. The next thing I remember is waking up in a psychiatric care facility. I don't remember any of what happened after I blacked out, nor do I remember most of the last couple of months. It's all a blur with a few moments of clear pictures. From what I was told, when I fell, the police officers busted into my apartment and called another ambulance for me. From there, I was later transferred to the psych facility because I kept shouting in my sleep about how he was close, so close. These night terrors would be so bad that they had to restrain and or sedate me several times because I would thrash and kick, resulting in minor injuries. During the day, I'd mumble to myself without even realizing it, unless it was pointed out to me about how the man in the bowler hat was coming to get me and everyone I loved. I was constantly on edge. It took a long time to calm me and break me out of this. I was there from March and was finally deemed well enough to be released after a full psych evaluation two weeks ago. They said that I had an emotional breakdown out of concern for Tabitha. I know that was part of it, but that wasn't the reason. I thought it best not to tell them that, though. When I got out, Jamal also told me that they found out that Omar had copied records, and they suspended him temporarily. Though, luckily, due to the fact that the records were so old and outdated, they didn't think that it was necessary to fire him. Anyway, I've been staying with Jason and his girlfriend in their apartment since I was released. It's not safe to go back home yet. Tabitha is staying with her parents for the same reason until this all ends. But we've been talking every day. Jason, Jamal, and I are going to be going on a field trip next week. This needs to end. I want to end this. Now. Now. 
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 